The excitement and energy were high as many came to check out the first ever New Hope on the island. Well, Aloha New Hope, Kipi Higa here. Uh, we just finished our grand opening here at New Hope Kahului and we are so excited about what the Lord is doing. We had a great turnout today uh, with over 100 people and we had over 35 kids. And that's just through Facebook and um, just having our friends let everybody else know that we're here to serve the Lord. And so thank you so much for your prayers and thank you so much for your support. We are very, like I said, very excited about what the Lord is doing. The Lord is already putting together a wonderful and very strong leadership team. And uh, we just want to say thank you again. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. We love you. From New Hope, Kahului, all right. Well, that's our newest church in Kahului, Maui. Isn't that great? New Hope Kahului. Dave Yogi and myself and Dan Shima were there last night. We were speaking to their leaders, wonderful people. They are just thrilled of what God's doing. So last weekend was their first uh, Sunday, and now they're moving into their second. So we have a sister church in Kahului, Maui. It's wonderful. Well, let's stand together. It's going to be a wonderful time of worshiping. Are you ready to worship? All right, here we go. Welcome the king. Let's worship him with all that we have. Here we go. Let's worship him. How many of you came to worship tonight? Amen. Yes, Lord, praise For the praise.
and we give our praises to you, Lord. We praise you, Father. It's in worthy. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And holy, holy is he. We'll sing a new song. We'll sing.
Do you take a hold of the person's hand next to you? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful church and what we're learning through it. Lord, also thank you for these times in which we find ourselves in. It's a, a time of change and transition, not always for the good, but it's good for us because it wakes us up so that the church will no longer be asleep, but we need to stand and rise. And Lord, begin to be a people that understand the reasoning of the Holy Spirit and the times we are in and what our assignment is so that we will know how then we shall live. We ask your blessings on this church. And thank you for all of the churches of Hawaii. Lord, people that are preaching the gospel and keeping us true to Christ Jesus. Oh, bring us back to that which is basic, the word of God and the one who is called the word of God. Thank you for that. As we talk about that today, Lord, help us to become people knowledgeable in your word. Not to just know that there's a book on our shelf, but that book gets off the shelf and into our hearts. May we be knowledgeable. We don't want to be people that, as you say, are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. We can have your word, but not have the knowledge of it, and we're in trouble. So, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to be not a people of the book, but a people where the book resides in us. So thank you for that, oh God. We ask your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, say welcome to somebody. Give them a handshake and a big old hug and say happy pre-Thanksgiving. What's up, New Hope? I'm Brandon, and welcome to this weekend's edition of New Hope in Action. I'm here backstage of the New Hope Junior Youth Performing Arts Center production, Suzuko Junior. Dane Eisen has been doing an amazing job directing this musical with a cast of children ages 8 through 12. They've been doing a fantastic job with this show, so let's take a look at what's been going on on this stage in the past two weeks. All the things you can think, think and wonder and dream for what you This Sunday, November 18th at 3 p.m., we'll be having water baptism at Magic Island. If you haven't been water baptized since receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now's the time to do so. We'll be having a church-wide potluck, so feel free to bring a dish and help us celebrate those who are water baptized. Take a look at this. I wanted Jesus in my heart as I go on my journey. Get a fresh start. I'm looking forward to peace and just having love all around me. It was always in His time and I just felt fulfilled. great way for women to make friends, I think, is by being part of New Hope Women's Ministries. We have so many wonderful events that are all geared toward helping women draw closer to the Lord and toward each other.
All women are invited to join the New Hope's Women's Ministry Christmas March. There will be a continental breakfast, fellowship with other women, a time of worship, Christmas carols, and a cooking demonstration by Angela Gonzalo, a personal chef and owner of That Girl Can Cook. She will be weaving some inspirational Christmas thoughts as she cooks and as we get to sample bites of her Christmas cuisine. Come and join us at New Hope Ministry Center on December 1st from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. For more information, contact Eunice Shinsato. That's all we have for this edition of New Hope in Action. There are so many exciting things happening here at New Hope, so make sure you get involved so you can be a part of the many great things that God is doing. For more information on any of the stories you've heard, you can visit our website at enewhope.org or visit the Next Steps tent outside after service. My name is Brandon, signing off. Aloha! Hey, could we give Brandon a big hand for that, uh, New Hope in Action? Can I be one of the first to say happy Thanksgiving to everyone? We're so glad you're here. Um, I want to reiterate one of the stories in the New Hope in Action, and that is baptism. Now, this is our last baptism of this year, and what a better way to start the Thanksgiving and Christmas season by coming down and getting baptized, having a brand new start in this holiday season. So if you've never been baptized, we want to encourage you to come down 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon, Magic Island. And if you have been baptized, again, church family, just come down and encourage and support, uh, play some volleyball and um, have some potluck. Uh, it is a great way to spend an afternoon. So we really want to encourage you to come down and get baptized and support those who are getting baptized. Well, my name is Tim Savage. I'm the director of multimedia. And if this is your first time here to New Hope, welcome. This is a great time to come visit and we hope join in. And if this is your first time, in, we, this is our bulletin. And in our bulletin, we actually have a tab just for you. So if you could fill that welcome tab out, tear it off, and then as the offering bucket comes by in just a couple of minutes, just drop it in. That's our way of being able to stay in touch with you and connect with you. Uh, well, as I mentioned, water baptism is tomorrow. And then again, this is Thanksgiving week. So I wanted to let you know that our offices will be closed on Thursday and Friday of this week, and we will reopen next week. Now, I think the main reason we're closed on Friday is so that everyone can go shopping on Black Friday, right? Well, uh, we have something really special for those of you who will be at Ala Moana, and I hope that I'm not one of those, but uh, those of you who will be at Ala Moana on Friday, our worship team is going to be down at center stage. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Yeah, I think that's pretty awesome. So uh, the team is going to be down there at 7 p.m., and they're going to um, uh, present song and, and dance till about 7.45. So I know you ladies are thinking, 7 p.m.? All have already been there 15 hours. That's, I got it's time to go home. But anyway, if you are there, uh, come down, support our, our team at Ala Moana Center. Really, really special. Great time uh, to do an outreach to those uh, there shopping. And then um, we wanted to remind you that in three weeks, um, we are having the Gift of Charity concert here at uh, Farrington, where the Moana Loa High School uh, music department comes together with New Hope, and we partner together, put on a fantastic concert. I know tickets are actually going fast, so there is a table outside, and I uh, highly recommend that you get your tickets early because that always sells out. So finally tonight, uh, they are um, training us for Thanksgiving at the food court. They're selling Lao Lao Mac salad and rice. So if you're in training for Thanksgiving, you want to make sure and go out and support them at the, the food table in the food court. Well, if our ushers would uh, prepare to take the tithes and offerings, and uh, if we would prepare our hearts to give, uh, we are in... Uh, uh, continuing our series, Jesus, Pure and Simple, and Pastor Wayne will be bringing a very important message entitled, One Thing. So that's what he's speaking on tonight, One Thing. So it must be very, very important. So if you all would bow your heads with me and join in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, this Thanksgiving week, uh, would you just create in us, in each of us, a heart of thanksgiving? a heart of appreciation. 
Lord, in this now, our time to give back to you, could we just remember all that you've provided for us, Lord, all those things that uh, we never did for ourselves, but you did for us, and maybe we don't even know, Lord, but could we just stop now and, and appreciate all that you do for us, Lord? And so uh, in this Thanksgiving week, we just want to say thank you to you, the one that really matters. And now, would you just open our hearts and minds as Pastor Wayne comes out and gives uh, a very important message, Lord? And so we ask all of these things in your precious name, in Jesus Christ's name, and we all say, Amen. Amen. Ushers, go ahead. Let's see here. What does it say? I know I can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Thwarted. That's an unusual word. Who says that? Ah, but you know what? I think I'm going to journal on that one today. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. You know, I haven't always been this way. When we first moved to Hawaii, let's just say there wasn't a love connection. I was really lonely. But God had a plan because the church we were going to, the pastor was doing a month-long series on being in the Word daily. He said, it will give you everything that you need to get through the day. And I thought that sounded pretty good. So that's what I did. I did devotions daily. And my husband was shocked because my whole demeanor had started changing. God really started doing a work in my heart and my husband started doing devotions with me. And things were great, for a while, that is, until we decided that we wanted to have children. And it took us a long time. We tried a long time to have children. But you know what? When we settled upon that in vitro and we, you know, it took a while, but at about nine months later, we had triplets, yeah? That was a lot of fun. We had all this time together, but all of a sudden, Brian and I were like in this alarm stage 24-7. We started getting cranky with each other, really angry with each other. And it lasted for like a year until one night when we were trying to go to sleep. I just broke down. I started crying, and I could not stop. I don't know why. It could have been the stress of the three kids. It could have been the pizza we had for dinner. I don't know. But I broke down. You know, and Brian did too. He started crying, and he reached out, and he held me. And that night, we just cried each other to sleep. The next morning, I got up, and he was at the kitchen table doing his devotions. And right next to him, was my Bible and my journal. So I sat down next to him, and after I opened it and realized it'd been about five months since I did my devos, we sat there together and we read. After we finished, we just went on our day, on the, uh, the rest of the way through our day. And it's been about a month since we started that ritual, and I wish I could say that things were peachy, but I can say one thing, that every day, when I'm in the Word, I am so encouraged to know that God is in control. And I just have to sit back and relax, right? Because I know that nothing, nothing can thwart God's plan. Not even three kids and a husband. <laughs>
beautiful presentation I love these presentations you know I say often people aren't tired of the word they're just tired of tired presentations of the word because the word is the power of God and the salvation in fact we want to talk about that today I know you know the answer to this but just to hazard asking you the question what book has sold over 50 per minute for decades and now has sold over 1 billion copies what do you think the Bible that's right the Bible is not really one book it's 66 books written by 40 authors over 1400 years the Bible covers hundreds of controversial subjects but all with harmony and unity based on the heart of God but there is as much as there is acceptance of God's Word there's also opposition critics Criticism, cynics fight against God's word again and again. Why? Because the enemy has mounted an all-out campaign against people reading the Bible. He doesn't mind if there's a billion copies out there. He does mind if you get into any one of those copies. Because that's when our lives are transformed and changed. So his crusade is to continue to keep people illiterate in the Word of God. You can have many Bibles, but if you don't read it, it will cause you to become a slave. A what? Yep, that's what Isaiah says. Isaiah said in, in chapter 5, it says, My people are in exile because of a lack of knowledge. And we find in Hosea chapter 4, it says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge in what? Amos 8 11 says it this way behold the days are coming saith the Lord when I will send a famine on the world but it will not be a famine of thirst or of hunger it will be a famine of hearing the word of the Lord we're people that have the Bibles around us but it's time for us to become people of the word see the Bible has had an unparalleled influence on the arts and literature and on our nation in fact, nothing has inspired novelists and poets and artists and composers, countries and nations more than this one book. Not to mention the millions and millions of lives that have been utterly transformed by the power in this one book. Because God honors these words. The Bible says that God has inspired or God breathed. In fact, it's sort of like this. He's saying, if you read the wisdom of Solomon, the same wisdom I gave to Solomon, I will breathe into you. 
the ability to make decisions wisely that I gave to Moses. When you read Moses, I will be happy, thrilled to give that same ability to you. That's why the enemy knows that if he can keep us unintelligent, ignorant of the Word, then he'll keep God's best out of us. So there's an all-out demonic crusade against getting to know the Word of God. In fact, if we are ignorant of the Word of God, just remember the way you think will shape your future and your eternity even if it is wrong. The way we think, even if it's wrong, it will affect and shape or misshape our eternity. We have to understand that our nation was actually birthed out of those who had a passion for the Word of God. You take a look at men and women that have changed the course of our nation. For example, a Martin Luther King. You need to know at least a basic knowledge of the Bible if you want to understand his philosophy and how he, with his courage, was able to change this nation. It was April 3rd, 1968. He spoke his last message. He was speaking about the injustices of America. And he said, all I'm asking America to do is to stay true to what she has written on paper. And then he said this, I have been to the mountaintop and I have looked over and I have seen the promised land. And then he said this almost as if there was a premonition, I may not be able to go with you, but we as a people must enter the promised land. So he said, I am happy and I have no worries and I do not fear any man for I have seen Mine eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. The next day he was assassinated. Probably one of the most gripping and tragic moments in America's history. But you see, if you don't understand even a basic understanding of the Bible, you won't understand what he was talking about. To a, a student that doesn't understand the Bible, doesn't read the Bible, it's just like gibberish. What was it about the promised land that he has seen it, but he may not go? Who is he talking about? Who is he comparing this to? You see, you won't understand much about even American history or our culture if you don't understand the Bible. And so what's happening is when we're pulling the Bible out, it's ruining our historians, and we will become poor futurists if we are poor historians. It is in the National Archives, right above the original Constitution that's framed there. It says these words, the past is a prologue to the future. If you don't understand the past, you are destined to repeat it. And so the Bible puts all of these stories there so that we won't have to repeat what they did. But we will learn from them. But we as a people, illiterate or unknowledgeable about the Bible, though we have copies, we never get into it. It, remain, it causes us, us to remain a slave to what's going on around us. I want to encourage us today to be motivated to be a people of the Word, to read it. Whether it's Roman empires or whether it's the Crusades or the Reformation or the pilgrims that wandered about or about England and the state church and the popes of the European times or Constantine. If you don't understand some basic things about the Bible, you'll not understand history. And when people misdefine it or what we call revisionists, they revise history and change it, you won't ever know and we'll lose who we are. Listen to what one high school teacher said, not even a Christian, said this. Today we discuss the old man in the sea when he carries the mast and he falls and he lies spread out on the mast. A picture of the crucifixion, but most of my class had no idea what was going on. And then, a tale of two cities, one man sacrificing himself for mankind and Sidney Carton, who walks through the garden struggling with himself just before he makes that decision. And no student understood any correlation 
I tell the students that I am not of any particular religious persuasion at all, but you have to know the Bible to understand our life and our culture. Pretty interesting. And I thought about that. I even think about the misunderstanding and the ignorance of our laws. People say, well, you can't teach the Bible in schools. That's not constitutional. No, what you just said is unconstitutional. They make reference to the Abington versus Shemp uh, decision in 1963. And it's a misinterpretation of it. In fact, in 1963, the Supreme Court ruled that public schools may not require devotional use of the Bible. They cannot require it. That was it. And in the same ruling, here's what the judge, the Justice Thomas Clark writes. And I quote, it might well be said that one nation's education is not complete without the study of the history of religion and its relationship to the advancement of civilization. Nothing we have said here, after he made the ruling, nothing we have said here indicates that such study of the Bible or of religion when presented objectively as a part of a secular program of education may not be affected consistently with the First Amendment. In other words, he's saying it's absolutely fine. You just can't use it to proselytize, but to teach students about how the Bible has helped to develop our culture and our nation is absolutely fine, and it's a part of our Constitution. If there's any judge or legislator that is, is confused about whether or not it's constitutional to talk about God, and to see how God really was a part of our nation. They have only to walk through the Washington Mall and take a look at our history. Take a look at, for example, the Washington Monument. It's a beautiful waterway. That monument is like a Roman or an Egyptian ob ob uh, obelisk that goes straight up 555 feet. And at the top of that is an aluminum capstone. And you know what it says around there, right around the capstone? Praise be to God. Isn't that interesting? If we're a non-Christian nation, pretty neat that a non-Christian nation would put that on one of its highest monuments. And then going up the stairs, emblazoned on the walls, it's almost as if the people who built this, our forefathers, knew that our country would keep our children away from the Word of God. And it will mutate our culture. And so it's written on the inside, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for to such is the kingdom of heaven. That's written on the inside. And more, knowing that we may be confused, it's almost like a code. And it's sitting right there in the Washington Monument. Search the scriptures. And almost as if we would expunge God from every place, schools and public buildings, it's written right under that. It says, holiness unto the Lord. You take a look at the capstones and cornerstones, the National Archives. Everywhere you go, you're going to see emblazoned in granite and marble scriptures that honor God that our forefathers thought very fitting to put there. In fact, at the top of the Supreme Court, you have all the lawgivers throughout history, of which are included Moses holding the Ten Commandments. Next to the him, a few, few down, Solomon. So they understood that the Bible is a very huge part of our foundation. Some people say, what about Jefferson? Jefferson, he wasn't really a Christian. Jefferson grew up in Monticello, that, or that's where he lived, his, his home. And there's panels that give his greatest excerpts from his speeches. And let me give you three of them, three of them. The first you will notice, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their... Yeah, no God? No. They're endowed by their creator. It was as natural as having conversations around the, the mall there at Washington. They, they would just have God uh, on their lips all the time. 
They are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Panel 2 in Monticello. Check this out. Almighty God hath created the mind free. You notice how he speaks about God all the time. If it were such a taboo, none of these would have been written in our country's documents. And I continue, all attempts to influence that mind, that free mind, influenced by temporal punishments, are a departure from the plan of the holy author of our religion. That's written by Thomas Jefferson. And panel three, listen to this. God, who gave us life, gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Indeed, here it is, listen, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that His justice cannot sleep forever. He was concerned about our country turning from God. So did Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln writes, there, in eyesight of the Washington Memorial, these words, and it says, The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. From the book of Psalms. Now, all of those are right there in our uh, Washington uh, Mall. And they were concerned that we would forget all of these things. Now, just think about it. Think about it. if we forget all of these, what happens? God says, but if you forget the Lord your God, if you do not do all of His commandments, a people whom you do not know shall eat up the produce of your ground and all your labors, and you will be oppressed and crushed continually. In other words, we'll keep working, but we won't own our produce. Now, this is a prophetic word for those who forget the Lord. And yet God put it on all of our marble and granite, and yet we are pushing God away. And then He gives us the Word, and if we're not knowledgeable about the Word, the Bible says you will go into exile. And then the prophecy, the Lord will bring you and your king whom you have set over you to a nation, oops, sorry, misspelled, which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve them. The alien who is among you shall rise above you. He shall tend to you, a lend to you, but you will not lend to him. Interesting. Other foreigners will start lending to us and we'll have to borrow from other nations. Did you know that 36 cents of every dollar we spend in America we borrow from a foreign nation? You shall be the head, he shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. Why? Because you did not serve the Lord with a glad heart. Why? What will happen? Well, then you're going to serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you, and the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar as an eagle swoops down a nation whose language you do not understand. The justice of God, said Jefferson, will not sleep forever. And God speaks about us being a people of the Word. Otherwise, what we produce, we don't own. Here's a real quick test. Who owns Gerber's? Huh? Yeah. How's about our famous Holiday Inn down the road? Who owns that? Not us. Even our beloved First Hawaiian Bank. Who owns that? Yeah, not us. Check out 7-Eleven. That's an old American uh, logo item there. Who owns that? Well, I wish we did. Japan owns it. What about Trader Joe's? We all love Trader Joe's. That's us. No, it's not. Germany owns that. What about Bud Light? All that you guys, the flavor you guys drink all the time. Bud Light. Well, we should own that. Do we own that? Belgium owns it. Well, for sure, American. There's the word American. We own that. Who owns that? Oh, Germany. Well, here, this is a Christian word, church's chicken. We own church's chicken. This will blow your mind. Yeah. Well, buy American. We need to buy American. Okay, so I go out and buy Banana Republic. You know where that's from? Yeah, well, I went out and bought Tommy Bahama. I'm wearing a Tommy Bahama shirt. 
Yeah, it's China I'm supporting. Well, I'm just gonna wear Docker's pants for sure that's made here. No, it's not, it's in Mexico. Okay, then I'm gonna have good Skechers shoes. Surely that's American, no, that's China. Well, forget it then, I'm just gonna stay with my vivid ease. I'm gonna sit with <laughs> Fruit of the Loom, because for sure that's made in America. No, it's El Salvador. Do you understand the prophecies of God? We produce everything, but we don't own anything. All the money that goes into that goes somewhere else to a people whose language we don't know. God gives us the prophecies. But you say, Lord, can we, can we choose you? The Lord says, oh yeah, you can. I have set before you this day life and death, and the blessing and the curse. So he says to us as people, please choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord and obeying His voice. You see, from the cornerstones to the capstones, from the halls of Congress to the hallowed hillside of Monticello, there's a mighty causeway of faith that throbs in the veins of America. It's faith. From the landscape of the... the uh, the prairies all the way to the capital. Now to try and eliminate that faith that's interwoven into our life, life and culture, that God founded here, to eliminate that's going to require a whole lot more than the intellectual dishonesty of certain judges and legislators, academicians and certain activists. It's going to require, if you think about it, take a look at the mall, the Washington Mall. It's going to require some chisels and sledgehammers on marble and granite because our forefathers knew that we'd have a tendency to leave the faith of our fathers. Now, sometimes I think about the recent votes in Washington and Colorado. It seems like they're taking that sledgehammer to our identity. And even though their intentions are there. They may, may not have sledgehammers. They might not have chisels, but the, the intention is there to blot out the knowledge of God and change the meaning of what God has done. But there's just one group of people that can stop it. Just one. And it's not the White House. There's one group of people that can stop it and keep God to be honored in America. And it's not going to be the government or the schools or the universities. It's the church of the living God. Do you understand how important we are? Do you understand that we must be a people of the Word? No, 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 not just owning one of these, but reading it. Because my people go into exile right here for the lack of what? Knowledge. Well, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free, says John. Will the truth set you free? Almost. It's the truth that you know that will set you free. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. What about the truth I don't know? You will go into exile. You must know the truth. Because if you don't know the truth of God's Word and, and the culture of our nation, how God birthed all of this, then you'll be easily duped. You see, what happens is ignorance breeds fear. Because when someone challenges us, oh, we're fearful because I don't know. And fear then brings retreat. And all the devil needs to advance is for Christians to retreat. And so we must become a people of the Word because we're not very knowledgeable. Let's take a look at this video that uh, might be interesting. 3,400 Americans some facts about the religions of the world, testing their specific knowledge on a battery of questions, Mormons, Muslims, atheists, and evangelicals. Which group do you think did the best? Dan Harris administers four of the key questions in our pop quiz. America is one of the most religious countries on earth, but today's new poll shows that many of us struggle to answer basic questions about faith, even when we've just left Mass. Will you tell me the names of the first four books of the New Testament of the Bible, that is the four Gospels? Uh, Mark, Jan, Matthew... No, I don't know them. You just, you just went to Mass? Yes. You don't know the, 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 the four Gospels? No. So what are the four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and fewer than half of Americans got it right. In fact, out of 32 questions on this pop quiz from the Pew Forum on religion and public life, Americans got on average 16 
Right. Do you happen to know the name of the holy book uh, in Islam? Quran. Oh, good job. Right. The highest scores, atheists and agnostics, who got nearly 21 questions right on average, as compared to white evangelical Protestants, who scored an average of 17.6, and Hispanic Catholics, who got an average of 11.6 questions correct. What's the first book in the Bible? Genesis. Where, according to the Bible, was Jesus born? Jerusalem. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> Church leaders we spoke to today said they found the apparently low Bible literacy troubling. We need a church that's strong, that knows its own holy book, and that is living according to it. The survey's authors say the poll does not mean that Americans are not serious about their faith. But church leaders say it may mean it's now time to get back to basics. Dan Harris, ABC News, New York. Interesting. We're pretty illiterate when it comes to the Bible, knowing things in the Bible. And we want to change that around. The Amos 811 famine. In fact, if you heard what he said, it's time to get back to the basics. Time to get back to the basics. And so that's why we want to go through this book that it's called Jesus, Pure and Simple, to remind us to get back to the basics. And today, can I encourage you to be a people knowledgeable of the word, otherwise we'll be duped by everybody else's words. So let's take a look at our notes. Jesus is in the house of Mary and Martha. Martha's scurrying around. Mary, moreover, was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. And Martha got a little upset and said, you tell my sister Mary to get off her bottom and help me in the kitchen. We got stuff to do, places to go, people to see. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha Stewart, Martha, Martha, <laughs> you're bothered about so many things. In fact, let's read it at the top of our notes. Go. But the Lord answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away. Would you underline one thing? Only one thing is necessary. Mary, moreover, was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. One thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen. She is what? She has... It's something you have to choose. In this, in this topsy-turvy world, one of the things the enemy would love to do is to keep you from the Word. You can have one or two, three Bibles in your room, but just stay away from them because it's not the truth that sets you free. It's the knowledge you have of the truth that will set you free. And he understands that. And so we need to break that famine and begin to be a people of the Word. One thing. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, would you read this next one with me? Go. Open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things from thy... Open my eyes? Why do we pray, open my eyes? Well, we're going to talk about that. But let me first go through a few things to look for when you're reading the Bible. Four things. Real easy. Here it is. When you're reading the Bible every day, number one, when you're doing your devotions, just look for lessons to be learned. Would you write that in? Lessons to be learned. There are lessons to be learned. Every problem that you will encounter will have already been encounter, encountered by someone in the Bible. Every problem will already have been encountered by someone here in the Bible, and they're going to leave clues behind as to how you can navigate through yours. Lessons to be learned. It's in the book of Cor Corinthians that we find that scripture that's next in your, in your uh, notes. Corinth was a church, uh, a city in, in uh, Asia Minor that Paul had planted where Greece is. And he planted a church in Corinth. But he writes a book to the Corinthians. And he speaks strongly to them about the danger of immorality. You see, Corinth had as its main goddess, the goddess Aphrodite. Have you heard of aphrodisiacs? It heightens your romantic pleasure and need. Herbs or whatever they put in there. 
And so that was the goddess of the Corinthians. And so you can see it was a very immoral city. It was a very rich city, affluent city, but people would come to take vacations in Corinth to take vacations from their wives and their moral standards. Paul plants a church right in that city. But it was, the problem wasn't that the church was planted in Corinth. No, it wasn't that the church was in Corinth. Paul wrote because Corinth was getting into the church. And he says, you can't do it. And he speaks to them. In fact, let's read out loud and read it nice and loud for me, this verse. Would you read it? Go. Let us not act as some did, and 23,000, nor let us, and... Pretty amazing. Lessons to be learned. You see, for them, they thought their behavior was fine. But the Lord says, no, if you don't know... In fact, let's read it here. Go, the next one, go. You err because you know not the Scriptures nor the power. You know, you know how we make mistakes and err? It's because we know not what God's Word says. But if you'll know what God's Word says, you'll find lessons to be learned and you'll catch it before you fall. Before you make the mistake, wisdom will flood you and you'll say, ah, because you see, you'll have two teachers in life, and they're both really good. You'll have a teacher of wisdom and a teacher of consequences. Both are fabulous teachers, and you'll learn. But let me tell you the difference between these two teachers. They're both excellent teachers. Consequences, though, will demand that you make the mistake first, and then she'll tell you the lesson. Wisdom says... I'll tell you the lesson first, and you decide if you want to make the mistake. I think I'll take the lessons and the class of wisdom, not consequences. Lessons to be learned. So as you're reading the Bible, look not only for that, but would you write down examples to be followed? Examples to be followed. There are so many divine mentors that have left you examples. Lessons to be learned are from consequences that they experienced. Examples to be followed are from those who knew what not to do, follow their example. Lessons from those who failed, examples from those who didn't. Examples to be followed. Oh, there are so many of them. In fact, did you know that God wrote all that's in the Bible not for history purposes, not for art. It's for you and me. That's what it says. Let's read it. Go. Now these things happened to them as an... And they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. These things happened to them as an example for us. They were written for whose instruction? Our instruction. And then read this next one, Romans 15. Go. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Isn't that amazing? Written for whose instruction? Ours. So that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scripture, we might have hope. Look for examples to be followed. And then look for promises to be enjoyed. Promises. There's 7,000 plus promises in the Bible. When you're going through something hard, look for a promise to hold on to. I remember when I was having heart problems and I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I was going to water baptism and couldn't even walk across Ala Moana Beach Park. I had to stop, sit down. I, was, I couldn't breathe. And I remember I got a hold of a scripture out of Psalms that says, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides thee I have nothing on earth. My heart and my strength may fail, but thou art the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I got a hold of that and I said, you are the strength of my heart. Even though my heart seems to be failing, you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And I quoted that again and again and that gave me hope. 
And when I went for the surgery and they put three stents in my heart, I kept hold of that hope, that promise. Look for promises, promises to be enjoyed. It says here in 1 Corinthians 1.20, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And this next one, would you read it? Go. He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped. Yeah. So how do we get out of the world and into the identity of God? Through the promises. Hang on to the promises. The promises about your future. The promises for your marriage. The promises that He's going to take care of you. That gives me hope. That gives me a confidence. I look for promises to be enjoyed. And finally, I look for Jesus to be revealed. I look for Jesus. Don't look for stuff of like facts in the Bible so that you can wow your friends. Don't look for just things about the Bible that gives you dogma or doctrine. Now look for Jesus. In fact, this, the Pharisees came to Jesus and they were studying the Bible word for word, every jot, every tittle, every twist of the word. And they would look for codes and numerical codes to see if there's any secret meaning in it. And Jesus stops them and says, whoa, whoa. Let's read what he says. Go. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it is these that testify of... Yeah, they're revealing me. Yeah, don't look for little snippets of this or that. Just look for Jesus to be revealed. It was in Luke 24 when the two, Cleopas and a friend, were walking to Emmaus. This was after the resurrection. They didn't know Jesus had resurrected. They just saw him crucified and laid in the tomb. They said, oh, that's it, man. That's no good. He's dead. So they started going to Emmaus, leaving Jerusalem. They need to get out of Dodge. And they were complaining and grumbling along the way. And Jesus himself, whoop, joins them and starts walking with them in his resurrected form. Now, they did not know it was Jesus. And so he's walking with them. I guess in our glorified bodies, we might not look kind of like we are now. I don't know. That'd be cool. I'll be taller and more handsome and I'll have black hair. So that's cool. <laughs> but he starts walking with these two guys. They don't recognize him. And, and Jesus said, what are you talking about? Oh, this one who said he was going to be the Messiah and the script, he's fulfilled the scriptures and here he is dead. Oh, everything's done. And the Lord smiles and says, whoa, let's read what it says here. Go, oh, foolish man, slow of heart to believe all the scriptures have spoken. And he... Be Concerning himself and all the scriptures. Would you underline all the things concerning himself. Did you know when the scripture says, open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things from thy law. Listen, here's the reason why we need to be in the word of God. Because I'm looking for lessons to be learned, examples to be followed, promises to be enjoyed. But you know what I'm doing? I'm attuning my eyes to see Jesus. I start seeing Jesus and I start recognizing him. Oh, that's him. Well, that's what he's like. Now, this is real important because what he's doing is he's training your eyes to recognize Jesus. I have a friend, his name is Mike McGonagall. We used to go hunting for deer and he would see one in the forest and he'd say, right there, right there. Now, I, I'm from Hawaii and I've got this big old rifle and I don't know how to shoot this thing, but he says, right there, right there, aim. I said, there's nothing but trees. He says, no, right there. I said, where right there? He said, right there, a big fork and horn. I said, I don't see nothing over there. I don't even see a car horn. I don't hear no horn, nothing. He said, it's right there. And, and, and I couldn't see it. So he picks up a rock and he throws, and all of a sudden, boing, this big old fork and horn deer just bounds off and look right there, there it is, there it is. <laughs> and I said, how come I couldn't see it? He says, because you, have, you haven't trained your eyes to see the stuff that's right in front of you. And you know, 
There's times Jesus is right in front of me and I can't see him. You know what the Lord is saying? I want to train your eyes. That's why the psalmist says, open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things. Would you write down in your notes, right at the end, when you begin to see Jesus in the Bible, you will begin to recognize him in everyday life. When you begin to see Jesus in the Bible, that's why he wants you to read the Bible a lot because we start to recognize Jesus, not only in the Bible, but now I can see him in my marriage, in this difficult situation, in this problem, in this decision that could, could destroy my future, alter my plans. I've got to see Jesus. Well, if I'm not training my eyes to see him in the Bible, you're not going to see him. You know why America is just leaving Christ even though he's everywhere? It's because we are illiterate in the Bible. There's a lady that came up to me and said, how come you don't teach more about the coming of Christ? I said, what do you mean? Yeah, you know, I mean, what dispensation are we in? I said, what? So I thought, I better go study this stuff. <laughs> and so I started studying it and and they had different Armenian views and Calvinistic views, and I had to start studying preterism and futurism, literalism. Uh, and then it was a premillennial and postmillennial viewpoints. And then there was pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. And there's hyper-Calvinism. And then there's different, I thought, this is nuts. So then I went to a college and to a seminary, and we began arguing over these different dispensations and preterism and anti-preterism and futurism, historicism. Uh, and we just had all term talking about these words. And I thought, you know, we can do this till the cows come home and there's people outside saying, could I get saved please sometime? <laughs> do you know Jesus? Could I get any help? And I thought, we can get so caught up and I thought, you know, it's interesting. The Bible says not, no one knows the coming of the, the, the Son of Man. Not even the angels know when that coming is. So we get so crazy about the coming of the Lord. And then I thought, now wait a minute. We're fighting over dogma about all of this. I thought, you know, if I'm ready for him to come, I don't worry when he's going to come. It's cool. Now, some people say, but don't you get excited about when he's coming? I say, you know, if I never see my wife and then I hear she's coming home, whoo, I'll get excited and scurry around. But what if I'm with my wife every day? We take walks together. We have breakfast together. We do things together. We, we read the Bible together. We go to church together. We travel together. And someone says, Anna is coming. So? <laughs> I just saw her. Yeah, but she's coming. Aren't you all flustered and nervous? No. No, we're with, the, we're with each other all the time. Yeah, but aren't you nervous? No. Well, you're crazy. Uh, I think you're crazy. <laughs> you understand how we can get so flustered over something? And I think, wait a minute. If we have a relationship with Jesus and I'm with him all the time, we talk all the time. And when someone says he's coming, wonderful. But aren't you like nervous? You're crazy. <laughs> Here's something I'd like you to know more about though. Instead of the coming of Christ, I want you to know about the comings of Christ. Say, what's that? I want you to be able to recognize Jesus so much from reading the word that during the day when he arrives, and speaks into a conversation, you can hear him. You can see him enter a, a, a time when you're talking with a friend, the coming of Christ. Christ comes right into that conversation and I can see him. I know it. I know it. See, some people are waiting for the coming of Christ. They miss all the comings of Christ. They miss him every day, every week. When they're talking to someone, they don't know that Jesus just showed up and opened the door wide for something and you miss it. I was in Lanai a little while ago and there was a guy that uh, had put his uh, golf clubs on the uh, van to go to the airport and I said, how'd you play? He said, terrible. And I said, isn't that funny? We could have stayed in Honolulu and played terrible. Now you just paid 500 bucks to play terrible. <laughs> and he laughed. And so then I see him at the airport 
and he puts his clubs up there and he says, you can have these clubs. And I said, no, I got some just as bad as yours. <laughs> and he laughed and he said, hey, you're Wayne Cotero. I said, yeah, last time I checked. And he said, I, I watch you on TV. I said, it's because they don't have anything else to put on. They put on my stuff. And he laughed a little and he says, you know, my daughter went to New Hope for a long time. She's going to college now in Canada, but she went there for a long time. Really helped her. I said, wow. And I thought, Jesus just showed up. I said, what about you? He said, oh, yeah, I don't go. I said, why don't you follow the example of your daughter? She's pretty sharp, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's really smart. Oh, no, I mean, she's sharp. He said, yeah, I got it, I got it. I said, I bet God's arranged all of this, even bad golf, for you to be reminded that he's waiting for you. He said, I think so. And I left it. Do you understand? Jesus came. It was a coming of Christ. And if we're not careful, we'll miss. We'll be looking for the coming of Christ and miss the comings of Christ all the time. We miss it again and again and again and again. A lady came out of the condo and she was waiting at where I live and, and she looked a little forlorn. I said, how are you? She said, oh, okay. I'm just kind of working with my husband. I said, oh, what's happening? Oh, he can't walk. He used to walk. He can't walk anymore. And it's, whew, it's really hard. Now, I don't know what came over me, but I said, let's pray for him. She said, huh? I don't know if she's a Christian or not. I said, let's pray for him. She said, okay. And so we prayed for him, and that's all. And I thought, I was a little embarrassed because I don't usually do that. So, bye, <laughs> you know, and I, I kind of left. Well, lo and behold, two weeks later, she comes up to me. And she said, we prayed for my husband. I said, yeah, I remember. She said, today he started walking again. I said, wow. Wow. I was coming out of the building, the planning uh, department and, and I think I shared this with you, a lady just came out and she twisted her ankle a little bit and she said, oh, ouch, and I ran over there and I said, can I help you? She said, oh, my ankle hurts. I said, well, let's pray right now and I prayed for her and after it was done, she stopped and she said, I went to Bible college a long time ago. I said, you did? She said, yes, thank you for stopping and praying for me and reminding me about God. I thought that was the coming of Christ. You understand? All these comings of Christ. If, if we're not careful, we won't see him anywhere. We'll think just he's, he's not around. I get off this platform speaking at a hotel for a bunch of Christian people, and the security guard comes up to me. Security guard from the hotel. I wasn't talking to him. I was talking to these Christians. The security guard comes up and says, I heard what you were saying. I said, you did, what'd you think? He said, it makes sense. I thought, Jesus just showed up. I said, well, sit down. He sat down, because I thought, Jesus just, just came. It was the coming of Christ. We sat down, we talked. I got to lead him to Christ, prayed for him. And I thought, wow, see, that's what it's all about. We can be studying praetorism, futurism, literalism, pre-millennial, you know, mid-trib, post-trib, whatever trib, don't trib. And, and, <laughs> and we miss all the comings of Christ. Folks, listen, th this is why the Bible is so important. So one, so if you're an elder, if you're a leader, if you're a senator, if you're a legislator, you will make far better laws because you understand how the Bible fits into the context of our culture. You miss this, it will take us into exile. And we'll think everything is the same, going on the same, but we won't own anything. Everything will be taken away from us. We will go into exile for a lack of knowledge. Then our children now are getting no Bible knowledge and history will be revised and rewritten right under our noses and we will lose our identity. We must be a people of knowledge. So where does it start with us, the people of God? right here. Because if we don't have it, it's going to happen out there. If we're not knowledgeable about the Word, everyone else won't be knowledgeable either because we reproduce what we are. We are the standard. We're the barometer of the nation. It's us that God says, you will be the ones that'll start everything or stop everything. It's right here. The church of the living God. So when you open your eyes, look for lessons to be learned from their failures. 
examples to be followed from their successes. Look for promises to be enjoyed, to hold on to in the time when you're going through struggle. And Jesus, look for him. Because when your eyes get attuned to seeing Jesus in the Bible, you'll begin to see him in everyday life. And that's the beginning of changes, transformations, and miracles. Amen. Be a people of the word. One thing that's going to be the most important of all. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Let's stand together as we conclude. Well, don't forget, tomorrow we have water baptism. So if you've never been baptized in water, let's go for it. And uh, die to the old, live to the new. Uh, come and bring a potluck dish, and we'll baptize you, and then we'll ha have a wonderful picnic. So come on, and uh, let's join in the festivities of the kingdom. All right? Would you bow your heads with me? If you're here today and you say, Wayne, I need to open my heart to Jesus. Because I'm really, when it comes to knowing God, I mean, I know about Him, but, oh, Lord, open my eyes. And it needs to start with me, not my kids, not my wife, not my husband, not, not someone else. It's got to start with me. Lord, would you transform me? Come into my life. If that's you, would you raise a hand right now and just say, I need Jesus. Yeah, go ahead. I need Jesus. Come into my heart, Lord, would you? Please come into my heart. Change me from the inside out. Yeah, yeah, so many. Let's all pray this prayer together. Would you pray this after me? Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you came. You died for my sins that I might have a life everlasting. I believe you. I believe your word and what is written in the Bible. And because of that, I come to you with great confidence and I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. And now I say this so everyone hears, so you hear me and I hear myself and so the devil hears, Jesus Christ is my Lord. He is my Savior. I belong to him. Thank you, Lord. We put our hope in you. Thank you for loving us like you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you give him a clap offering? Thank you, Lord. Give someone a hug on your way out, would you?